Amen. Wow, what a wonderful time of praise. Thank you so much, Clark and team. Great to see you today. Had a great group in our first service this morning, and then just so wonderful to see your faces today as well. <clears throat> Join me, if you will, in prayer. Father, what a wonderful day to be alive, to know you, <clears throat> to worship you here in this place. And Lord, we ask you, just as we sang in prayer, that your spirit would fall on us, that you would move in this place in a powerful way, in a tangible way, that we would go home having been with Jesus. Help us to hear your word, to receive it, to act on your word. And Lord, we pray for, <clears throat> excuse me, Eagle Springs Baptist Church here, a sister church, that you would do a great work there today, that you would equip them and use them and provide for them. And we pray for Kit and Stacy serving as our missionaries in France, and just pray that you would use them in a powerful way today, that you would let the Spirit move and work in France in a new and fresh way to your glory, that you would let many, many of the French come to know you as, Christ, as Savior, but also the multiple, multitude of cultures who live in and travel through France, that you'd use our missionary units there to reach them in this gateway city. And Lord, now help us as we listen and apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your copy of God's word and turn to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Matthew 7, as we keep working through the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7 will be in the first six verses this morning. In Matthew 7. There was an English lady, and she had come to the States. It was time for her to return home, and so she went to the airport a little early. And while she was waiting in the waiting room, she decided she would buy a snack, so she bought some tea and cookies. And there was a seat next to her, and then a man sitting two seats over. Well, much to her shock, she saw out of the corner of her eye that the man was opening her cookies. And then she watched as he ate one. Well, she didn't want to cause a fuss, but she wanted to let him know that she knew it was happening, and so she reached over and ate one as well. And then he ate one. And she ate one, down to the last cookie, and then he had the gall to break the last cookie in half and eat half of it. Well, she couldn't believe this American man, and then it's time to get on her flight, so she picked up her things, she went on her flight, she sat down, she opened her purse, and what did she find? Her cookies. Yeah. Oh, we are so quick to draw conclusions, particularly about others. So let's listen to what Jesus says to us about this. Do not judge, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye and ignore the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So Jesus says, don't judge, and then by what standard you judge others, that's the standard by which you will be judged. And the word judge here means to divide, to condemn, it's a condescending, condemning looking down on others. Now, some will misunderstand this passage and say, Jesus has never judged. Well, no, the Scripture says we're to judge between right and wrong, we're to have principles, all of those. This is about that looking down on someone else while simultaneously lifting yourself up. And so he says, you choose. How do you want me to judge you? Use that same standard to judge others. Learned from my wife, great practice with many children or with any number of children. Uh, if two children are going to share a piece of cake or a cookie, let one divide it, let the other choose which piece. 
Otherwise, the one dividing it will accidentally make one side of it a lot bigger than the other. That's what Jesus is saying. You decide, and I'll use that same measure with you. Do not judge. And he says, you, the reason that you see so much sin in others is because it's right there in front of you. It's a, it's a really vivid picture that, that he gives, and much could be done with it. They're just picturing this big log in the eye of the righteous or the self-righteous looking out at the speck that is in his brother's eyes. There's two ways of thinking here, Jesus is saying, in effect. One way of thinking says, well, my sin, if you want to call it that, it's excusable. I mean, after all, I'm only human. We make mistakes. But that one, that brother, that sister, oh, I just can't believe what they do in their walk with the Lord. Or, the first one is judging. Dear Lord, I am a forgiven sinner. Every day I am forgiven because of the cross. Lord, thank you for forgiving me. I'm a work in progress. My brother over here, my sister over here, oh, Lord, they need to be set free. How can you help me to be of use in their life? See, what is your goal when you look at other believers? Is your goal to push them further down or by God's grace as he uses you to help pull them up out of the sin? Would you be more happy if they stayed where they are so that you could condemn them? Or would you be more happy if God set them free so you could rejoice with them as God does a work in their lives? We often think we know everything about other people's lives. We think we know all we need to know by what we saw or by what we heard. But as a matter of fact, we often get a snapshot, but really there's a video that we don't see. If we saw the video, we'd see what happened before. We'd see what's happening in the background. But we take the snapshot, we draw our conclusions, and we're right. And so Jesus says, no, no, you're thinking about others. I want you to start with you. Think about you and your walk with me first. And he'll get to the other. How long have you been a Christian? How long have they been a Christian? Those of us who have been a Christian a long time, those of us uh, like, like me, I'm so privileged. I grew up in a Christian home. I knew the truths when I came to Christ. I knew what I was supposed to be doing. That was part of the burden and the grief was that I was living a life contrary to what I knew the Word of God taught. But we're pretty guilty sometimes of looking at a new believer and thinking, wow, I can't believe they don't have it all together yet. Folks, we're a work in progress. I'm not there yet. And if you're there yet, then you need to listen real closely. And we're not there. We're growing in grace daily. We're growing in sanctification we see it there in the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. He says, why? Why do I do the thing I don't want to do? Why do I not do the thing I want to do? In fact, the struggle is a good sign that the Spirit of God is in you, convicting you. But we tend to look at others and say, wow, here he is. He's been a Christian for two weeks. Why doesn't he have it all together? And yet no one's discipled him. No one's discipled her. They've come to Christ. We've baptized them. We've set them on the back pew and said, you're good. And that's what we're working against here at Sandia Baptist. When I'm counseling with someone and there's a relationship issue, and it's between two people, maybe it's between two spouses, and the one comes in and they share, this is what my spouse did to me that was wrong, this is what my friend did to me that was wrong, this is what my parent or my child did to me that was wrong, probably a lot of it's true. Sometimes not all of it, I mean, not intentionally. But I don't spend that counseling session focusing on the one who's not in the room. All that does is, is feed bitterness. All that does is feed judging. Now, hopefully, I'm going to get a chance to speak to that person. And when I speak to that person, I'm going to speak to them about their situation. But I'm going to spend that counseling session talking to the one who is in the room. Hey, how can God help you? to forgive? How can God help you to not judge? How can God help you to begin praying for this relationship? How can God help you to apply the Scripture from your side in this relationship? Because we're so tempted to judge. It's easy to talk about people who are not in the room. It's easy for us as a church to spend our energies bashing those people out there doing wrong. 
Well, if they don't know Christ, how are they not to do wrong? We want those who don't know Christ to live like those who do know Christ, while simultaneously we are often not walking like those who do know Christ ourselves. So Jesus says, you work on you first. And again, he doesn't say that we can't help others because that's what he goes on in the second section here. He says to help others with humility. In verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's, it's scriptural for us to help one another. Galatians 6, verse 1, Paul says, if anyone is caught in trespass, you who are spiritual, go and restore that one with a spirit of gentleness, praying that you not also be tempted. So we see in Matthew 18, we see this, what, what we call the church discipline text there. But the purpose of Matthew 18 is not to cast folks out that sometimes may have to be the case if repentance is never reached, but the purpose of Matthew 18 is to bring the person back in, going with a spirit of humility, going saying, oh, here, here's a truth, because some things just, they're clear. We, we have to, to deal with them. This can't happen and call ourselves believers, but it's with humility, hoping the person can find repentance to be brought back into a deeper walk with God and a deeper walk with His church. The Lord brought this home to me very clearly when I was 17 years old. My father had left our family when I was in fifth grade, and the court had decided that I would go see him twice a month, and, and I did, but it was begrudgingly. And I had bitterness toward him. I, I hadn't forgiven him. I came to Christ when I was 16. I was in a youth Bible study, and this passage that we're studying today was the text, and God just brought it very clear. He said, what about you? Aren't you focused a lot more on your father and, and, and his parents' sin than you are your own? And that's, I'm guilty, yeah. So I prayed to the Lord about it, and in prayer forgave my father. Then I wrote my father a letter and said, I forgive you, I love you. I thought I was setting my father free. I was setting myself free. And from that day on, our relationship began to grow, and our relationship was, was sweet and close all the way until the day of his death. Would you today need to ask God to forgive you of focusing a lot more on other folks than on yourself, holding other folks to a standard that you're really not applying to yourself, looking at the world, as someone said, through cross-shaped glasses? It's pretty easy to find folks who offended you. If I haven't offended you today, again, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance, but I'll try to uh, at some point. I mean, it's just, it's natural. And boy, you could make one list or the other. You could make a list of all the people who have done you wrong, and the devil will just keep supplying names for you. Or you could make a list of what you've done against our Lord, and that first list will begin to get very small. Well, the Lord does want us to help one another with a spirit of humility. Which one would you respond better to? Someone approaches you in the hallway of the church, really you've never spoken to them much at all, and they say, hmm, I am so ashamed, I am so shocked at your life, what you're listening to, what you're watching, what you're drinking, all these things. Or someone you know who's invested in your life Hey, brother, sister, could I talk to you? You know, over the years, the Lord has worked in my life, and he's, he's set me free for some things that I didn't think I could be set free from. I didn't know how it could be to live a different way. And I'm still growing. Would you consider thinking about this or that? Now, sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes in the church, there are things that are so grievous and plain that they just have to be addressed by anybody. But you see the difference there? And so we need to be investing in one another's lives. This is one of the reasons we were going to launch in May our circle, part of our discipleship pathway, trying to get three to five believers together of the same gender, preferably, so you can really do life on life and get to know one another. You need to be giving permission to other people to get in your life and to get in your face and to get in your lane. 
There need to be some people in your life that you're giving that permission to, whether you're verbally saying it, which is a good idea, or at least it's obvious that you're allowing them. You have permission to speak into my life when you see something that needs to be spoken about. We need that as believers, but it's done with humility. It's done understanding that I'm a sinner just like you are a sinner. Are you the only one who handled COVID-19 correctly? You can be tempted to think that. Everyone else got it wrong, but you were the only one who handled it correctly. Are you the only one who's handling and understanding the racial issues in our nation correctly? We're tempted to think that way. And even as a side note, even, even that is about judgmentalism, about assuming something about someone else, whether it's their race or their background or the way they look, on and on and on. But we're tempted to think, I'm the only one driving correctly. I'm the only one living correctly. And God would say, how about you start with you and me? I've got a few things I want to talk to you about. Keep short accounts with God. The cross pays for all of our sin. If you've come to know Christ as Savior, you know for sure that if you died today, you'd spend eternity with Christ in heaven, not because you're good, not because you're a church member somewhere, but because you've been born again. The Spirit of God has come to live in you because you've repented of your sin. The sin is paid for, but talk about it with God. In your daily walk with Him, in your daily time of prayer and the Word, if there are issues, He'll bring them up. But don't push them off. Miserable Christians say, I don't want to talk to God about my sin. And God says, I do, because I want to pull you close. I want to set you free from that. And miserable Christians say, I don't want to talk to God again about that. It's just too many times. And God says, is the cross not enough? Come talk to me about it so I can help set you free from that. And if I have to set you free from it again tomorrow, let's talk about it then as well. And God says, start with you so that you can help others. But the last point here, that real change begins with God's people. You know, spiritual awakening comes after, almost always, revival. God's people get right with God first, and then spiritual awakening will oftentimes come. He says here in verse 6, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And at first, as I began to study this passage, I thought, now why is that here? It's its own paragraph. It's a new thought in one sense, but it's right here with these other. It's in between two different thoughts. Your English Bible is probably like mine, that it's lumped together here. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Well, likely the meaning here is that meat that had been sacrificed to the Lord, and then later, if, if you, it's an example Jesus is giving. If you were to throw that to the dogs, you're taking what has been given to the Lord and throwing it to the dogs to gnarl and chew and eat. And dogs were considered very you know, vile, low uh, animals uh, on the earth. So taking what's holy and throwing it to the dogs, he says, and taking the pearls, and pearls oftentimes in the Scripture have this uh, illusion of the gospel message, the truths of God, taking the truths of God and throwing them out to the unclean swine, and they will just be trampled and eaten. Now, what is all of that about, oh, Lord? I begin to, to wonder. It's used many different ways. We take that one verse, and it can be used a lot of different ways, but what does it mean here really in context, Lord? Well, for one, as I mentioned, for us to take these conversations about coming to know Christ, growing in Christ, and to then transpose them out on the world, to, to go to a lost person who doesn't know Christ and say, you know, the problem with you is that you're living in this sin and this sin and this sin. Well, well why not? Now, what they need to, to do is to come to Christ as Savior. That's the answer for the problems in the world. We throw the word gospel around, but no, it really is true that as we pray for revival, as we pray for spiritual awakening, that men and women and boys and girls coming to Christ and have their thought processes changed, that's what brings real change. But that's what they need first, and then to be transformed from the inside out, not from the outside in. We've created over the years many folks who've tried to change from the outside first without letting Christ change the inside. The operating system needs to be replaced. That's one part of this. Another part of this is, again, gaining uh, this right to, to talk to people in certain ways, but taking the Lord's things and thinking that the outside are going to understand them and taking the issues inside the church. There are many people 
who'll never darken the door of a church because they've heard so much about what's wrong at other people's churches. Those conversations are to be among God's people. These judgments, judging me first, and then getting involved in your life and talking to you about your life as you talk to me about my life, that's inside God's house. Over in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, you guys, church at Corinth, you've got a problem. You've got issues between one another, and you're taking them to the secular courts. He says, no, no, no. You don't take that stuff outside the church. He says, what would be a little bit better is if you'd at least decide those things and judge among yourselves. But he says, you really want to win the war. The best would be if you'd forgive each other and look more at what you've done to Christ than what others <clears throat> have done to you. Change happens inside. I've been in churches before. I've been in Sunday school classes before, not here, praise the Lord, where, the, the, again, the theme is, what's wrong with the world? And that doesn't help anybody. Or the theme is, what's wrong with me, and how can I then change and pray the world gets the same change through Christ? Now, there is a lot wrong with the world. You're right. But I need to change. And then when I change, and as I'm praying for the world to experience the same change from the inside out. Today, the Lord may be convicting you, and you need to just do some business with God about your heart towards others. And that God would just help you to, again, say, I want to work on me, God. And then I want to see how with humility I might help that brother or sister. Because they probably do need help. It's just that I have had a heart to want to go at it the wrong way. I said this to you before. If there's someone in your life, a Christian brother or sister, and they, someone needs to talk to them, and you're excited about it, you're probably not the one to talk to them. Or at least not until your attitude is different. When your attitude becomes one that says, God, it's, it's a burden. I don't want to, to talk to them about this, but by your grace, I feel like I'm supposed to. You may be the right one to talk to them. There are those who are excited to confront other people, and that's probably not their gift at this point. The Lord may be talking to you about your relationship with him because there is one final judge. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior and you're here or you're watching online, there is a judgment to come for all of us. And the answer to that judgment, the deliberating evidence in that judgment will not be were you good, were you better than others, were you a church member, were you a seventh generation church member. It will be, have you told God, I agree with you, I'm a sinner, and I need what Christ did for me on the cross. And he's come to live inside of you. So if you've never done that, don't wait another day. Today, whether you walk these aisles or whether they're in your home, you trust Christ as your Savior. You just go to God. The words aren't important. They're not magical. It's just a heart that turns to God and says, I admit it. I believe I'm a sinner. And I believe, even though it's hard for me to even understand it in full, I believe that you came from heaven to die on a cross for me. Would you please forgive me, come into my heart, and live there as my Lord and Savior forever. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word to me this week about judging, about humility before you and before others. Help us as a church, Lord, to be the church that simultaneously holds hard and fast to the truths of your word, to the guiding principles of your word, that we would, Lord, work towards being pure in our teaching, and we'd work towards applying that teaching accurately, consistently, that we'd have high standards, your standards, and yet when folks come in around us and they come in these doors, they'd say, those folks are loving, they're humble, they believe that they are sinners growing, and that people would say, Lord, about this church and its members, they've found a treasure in Christ, and they're hotly pursuing him while also trying to bring others along, recognizing that others need help and need love and acceptance. Oh, God, help us to get that right. Send revival to us at Sandia Baptist Church so that we are getting right with you, that then we'd be full of your spirit to help others, help other believers get right with you, and then help the lost come to know you as Savior. Oh, God, would you move in us in that way? There are those here live and online who need to trust you as their Savior, need to nail that down and not trust in religion, but trust that they've truly come to know Christ. 
Oh God, help them today to do so and then share it with us. Lord, there are those who need to follow you in believers' baptism, who need to join this church at this time in their life, and many other decisions that you have spoken to our hearts about. Oh God, help us to respond obediently to you today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.